Hellraiser. Beyond any terror you have imagined, a nightmare, unlike anything you have witnessed, is born. Because within these walls, the unholy is unleashed. Hellraiser, a film by Clive Barker. We'll tear your soul apart. Is imagination simply contained in the mind? Or does it tap into an unseen world with messages waiting to be told? There is a place where legends cross over into our world, where strange visions and whispers beckon and superstition takes hold. Step into the Black Cat's shadow. Welcome back to the Black Cat Shadow, a horror movie podcast where we talk about your favorite horror movies and how they parallel folklore, urban legends, and true crime. I'm your co-host, Andy Podcasting, from Kansas City, Missouri, and along with me is my co-host, Dakota. How's it going today, Dakota? Uh, It's going awesome. I uh, had a great day today, and I'm ready to have a great night talking about some some creepy events going on with uh, Hellraiser. Yeah, so we're going to talk about the movie Hellraiser from 1987. And with that, uh, you know, if you haven't seen the movie, you know, it it deals with some of the topics it deals with is like artifacts that open portals to hell and some demonic beings. So we're going to talk about that kind of stuff and some of the urban legends and folklore that kind of revolve around that. And then also we're going to get into a movie review of Hellraiser. We're going to talk about that too, what we thought about that movie. And if we think that you should go check it out. So as always, you can find us on social media. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at Black Cat Podcast. And um, you can find us on Horror Amino as well. Just look up Black Cat Shadow for most of those and you'll find us. And you can find our podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. And uh, probably a bunch of other podcast apps. You know, going through folklore and, and legends and stuff, you always have these uh, stories about people making deals with the devil, you know. And, and Dakota, are you familiar with the story of Faust? Uh, Faust was the man who uh, made a deal with the devil, right? And he, uh, for like eternal life or something like that. Yeah. I'm not too familiar with it. Um, we talked about it in school, uh, kind of kind of touching on uh, like urban myths and things. Um, but I mean, we didn't really touch on it too far. So, yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not too familiar with it either. But I I know the general concept about it. There's numerous stories about people trying to make deals with the devil, either to to solve a problem or to gain a moral life. You know, th- different things like that. But it's 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 always interesting how through most of the stories that we see or movies that we see, it always like ends up like. Uh, it doesn't turn out how the person really wanted it to turn out. Uh, there's always a twist to the deal, you know? And so like, of course, you know, they, they're always trying to to sell their soul within Hellraiser, the movie, you know, it's basically, it's about like somebody, a, a man who's, you know, hedonistic. Basically he just experienced like every pleasure that there is to experience. Nothing is enough for him. You know, he wants the next level of experience of pleasure. So he like, basically ends up buying this artifact that's promised to bring him you know to to the to new doorways of pleasure and experience he ends up summoning these beings which are called cenobites from another dimension and in this other dimension they they kind of blur the line between pain and pleasure and uh, you know the cenobites they take frank back to their dimension with them and basically torture him you know and or you know do all this crazy stuff and yeah, so basically like, the main topic of Hellraiser is where you, know, you have like, you know, making a deal with the devil kind of theme and um and you just see how it doesn't work out. Um so anyway, so 
you know, and through history, through mythology, we hear about different artifacts that that bring power to the owner, but at the same time, they bring like doom. You know, they they bring some kind of catastrophe upon the the owner. You know, like in the Bible, you've got the Ark of the Covenant. Um, you know, it's one of these things where it it can bring the owner's great power, but when not properly handled, or when it's possessed by people with ill intent, you know, it it usually causes disaster and death. Um, you know, and also classical mythology you have uh, the necklace of Harmonia, and it allowed the woman that wore it to stay young and beautiful forever, but it caused disaster to for whoever owned it. Um, in Norse mythology, there is the ring of the dwarf Indwari, and uh, so this ring would give the owner the ability to increase their gold, to find gold, I guess, or to get more gold, but also had a curse to kill whoever owned it. And uh, in Plato's The Republic, there's this ring, uh, it's called the Ring of Gyges, or G Y G E S. G-Y-G-E-S, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it turns the wearer invisible, but it, it leads to corruption of the wearer. It's, it's kind of like the, the one ring in The Hobbit, the wearer would become obsessed with it and be consumed by their addiction to the ring. And then, uh, and then in uh, Finnish mythology, there's the Sword of Kulervo. And uh, it helps the owner to, it basically it talks the owner into, into committing suicide. And then the, the sword like drinks their blood, basically. It's kind of weird. Um, and, uh, you know, and I was kind of trying to find like, accounts of one of these artifacts or something actually existing in real life. Um, I did kind of happen upon this one strange object that um, that was found in an old hotel. And it's, it's, uh, the hotel is in Anderson, Kentucky, and it's called the Anderson Hotel. And it's an old historic hotel with kind of a checkered past, kind of sinister. Um, a lot of kind of nasty stuff went down there. Um, so the caretaker, while he was kind of researching and kind of going through the hotel, I think he was trying to get it fixed up to reopen it and uh, you know start make it a hotel again. He found this wooden tablet covered in symbols, strange symbols that don't really correspond to any language and there's also pictures of like snake-like creatures on it and there was like stains that suspiciously look like blood on it so he really didn't have any clue as to the purpose of the tablet um or where it came from but as soon as he found it kind of weird stuff really started happening to the the guests of the hotel and and you know people just didn't want to stay the night there uh you know people have been like pushed and even bit by like an unseen presence so it's kind of freaky uh, to to hear about that and to see that there was like a real life instance of one of these kind of weird artifacts. We don't even know if it, what it was used for, but just strange things that happened around it. And then also like this movie Hellraiser touches on the topic of, you know, hell gates or portals to hell. And uh, Dakota, you kind of was looking at the mythology or the legends surrounding the portals to hell. What did you find out? Uh, well, with the portals to hell, a lot of... Uh... A lot of the energy that uh, comes from like demonic possessions or from like paranormal activity or even from uh, like everyday events like murders, um, those uh, those events create negative energy, which in turn creates hauntings and even more extreme, more hauntings. You create portals to hell. Um, all over the world, there's 13 places that have been confirmed to be the most haunted places in the world. Um, like uh, in Japan, uh, there's the the Fingdu, or I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, but it's called the Ghost City, where you pass through that, you pass through this archway, and it's a completely different feel. Uh, you go up the steps into this into this different town. It almost feels heavy in a way. People describe it. Those places are so heavy with the paranormal that supposedly, instead of going into another town or into another city, you're traveling to hell. You're seeing what hell looks like on the other side, or you're feeling hell. Um, not necessarily you're traveling to hell yourself, but demons are coming from the other side, according to mythology. I mean, this dates back all the way down, uh, all the way to ancient Rome. Uh, we hear like stories of, uh, of like Lerna Lake uh, was uh, supposedly an entrance to the underworld, um, and then uh, Orpheus. Uh, this is kind of a Greek thing. Uh, he traveled to the Greek underworld in search of Eur. Eurydice, I think is how you pronounce it, uh, by entering the cave at Terranium. 
or Cape Terranon. Um, it was basically just all these stories kind of talk about going to the underworld or going to hell. I think in the United States we have these two. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of speculation like uh, Stoll, Kansas, and the Stoll Cemetery being one of the gateways to hell due due to all the hauntings and all the uh, paranormal activity. Um, I know I've asked you about it before, but um, you've you've heard of the the paranormal activity going on in Stoll, Kansas, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of a old old legend, you know. Every, I think a lot of people kind of are familiar with that <clears throat> urban legend here in the Kansas City area. Yeah, it's 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 a very it's a very big legend, and it's it's Kansas uh, Kansas alone. Um, I know in Missouri there's some places too, but um, specifically in Kansas, it is a terrifying sight to actually go to these places. I've been to Stull, I've been to Salina and Atchison, some of the most haunted places in the Midwest. Um, it almost feels different. And I think a lot of that has to do with what we call ley lines. Uh, ley lines are just sites of paranormal activity or sites of like murders. Um, I kind of, uh, kind of did a little bit more research into that and found out that um, in the United States, we have a, we've had a lot of like uh, mass shootings and stuff. Um, just in like North America alone, uh, we contribute to most of the mass shootings in the entire world just because we have the most guns and the most uh, the most violence. I'm not necessarily I'm not necessarily trying to get into a political thing here, but um, one thing I've noticed is uh, we're looking at this picture, kind of like starting all the way up in like Canada and goes all the way down to Haiti. Um, it's kind of like a pentagram. Um, the shape kind of includes like the shooting in Mount Hood. Uh, the JFK assassination in Waco, Texas, uh, Mexico City bombings, Oklahoma City bombings, Columbine, uh, 9/11, the DC sniper, uh, and then there's one all the way up in uh, all up in Canada, uh, St. John's massacre, uh, and then there was the Connecticut, there was the Sandy Hook shooting. They all kind of match up and form these kind of lines. You can kind of trace them in straight lines to, to each other, and in the center of it. Uh, specifically was the Wisconsin shooting massacre at Oak Creek. It almost looks like a pentagram. It's really creepy how they all kind of line up and you know it's interesting how like these things these horrible things kind of happen along these ley lines and um, and I think the ley lines themselves are just kind of like uh, I, I haven't really researched it very for a whole lot myself but they're kind of like do they have something to do with like magnetic lines or, or fields around the earth or, or are they just more like energy? Well uh the, the, the definition of ley lines, uh, they're hypothetical alignments of a number of places of geographical interests, such as ancient monuments and megaliths. Uh, I'm reading this directly from uh, a website called Ancient Wisdom. Um, they have a lot of they have a lot of really good information on there. They talk about a lot of uh, a lot of paranormal things, kind of talk about mythology. Um, I get a lot of my information from here, so they are pretty they're pretty good uh, source. You can actually buy books on there too, too I believe. Um, but uh, ley lines existence was suggested back in 1921 by an amateur archaeologist, uh, Alfred Watkins, um, whose book The Old Straight Track brought the alignments to the attention of the wider public. So what we have are – they're just hypothetical uh, lines that kind of match up with all these, uh, all these monuments. Like we're talking about Stonehenge. People yeah. say Stonehenge was a site for uh, summoning demons by the, uh, by the Celts, by the paganistic Celts. Yeah, I mean – well, yeah, and even yeah, some of the pagan uh, Celtic stuff it goes back to like BC days, you know, and you know they don't really know where Stonehenge really actually came from, <clears throat> but it's interesting how yeah those structures are are placed on where these ley lines go over, you know, where these these theoretical lines, you know, there you can't really prove they exist, but there is a lot of coincidence where like these events, you know, these horrible events happen along them, or these ancient structures were built on these. Uh, intersecting lines and stuff you know it's it's really interesting to see that it kind of makes you really think that there's something to it but yeah i don't i don't think we, we you know obviously we don't have all the answers i'm not gonna say whether they do or they don't exist but it's it's interesting to study about yeah and so something i did find that was really interesting um some of these ley lines uh specifically in the like european countries they all match up in like specific areas where we go from like uh like stonehenge and even like more modern areas like uh, uh, Big Ben, um, they match up exactly, and that's kind of that's kind of where we that's kind of where we get into the more uh, 
the more science side of it. We have we have modern day scientists and modern day like conspiracy theorists talking about this, and uh, we talk about the Easter Island heads. Uh, kind of, I don't know, on Easter Island, they kind of they there. We don't know where they came from. We just know they're there. Um, again, those are very mysterious. I mean, the pyramids match up. If you can look, you can go on any any Google search and go onto the images, and you'll look. You can see a map, a ley lines map of the whole entire world. There's literally millions of ley lines that go all over the world so we don't know exactly how or where these ley lines come from we don't know if it, if they are matching up with like paranormal sites or gateways to hell um something i wanted to mention about like some of the gateways to hell people people actually do have the ability to summon demons or summon satan themselves um satanist cults or uh like satanic cults i mean um believe that you can summon satan himself into a room and like commune with demons i mean there's there's spells online where you can go and you can learn how to summon demons i mean you can even go learn how to summon crossroad demons to make deals that's what kind of what you're talking about <laughs> with yeah, yeah. uh with, with hellraiser um kind of where hellraiser goes off on its own tangent was with uh with the with the uh possessed items i mean the box the little uh, puzzle box that Pinhead and his uh, and the uh, Cinemites come out of. They're coming from another dimension. They say that they refer to themselves as either angels or demons in the movie. They've been called both. Yeah. <laughs> uh, angels to others, demons to others. But they're said that they're just travelers and they're just exploring. Exactly. But yep. we don't. We don't. Yeah. We can't really. We can't really narrow it down to one specific group or another. Uh, but in today's culture, we refer to them as demons. We refer to them as uh, sexual. Uh, like I, I think honestly, I think that the Cenobites themselves are uh, succubus, are succubus and incubus, two uh, two class of demons. Um, they do the same thing. They feed off sexual energy. Oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and and these Cenobites, you know, within the movie, like they're not really like. You, you go into the movie thinking that they're going to be like the antagonists or the bad guys but they're really i mean i guess you know you could say in some ways they are but but i mean for the most part they're not i mean it's it's like the humans you know that are you know that are doing the the you know the bad stuff you know the evil and the uh, the cenobites are just kind of like there you know they're you know they just you know once you summon them like okay we're here you know and they're just doing what they're what they do you know so it's interesting to see that yeah, and um, something I wanted to mention before I kind of forget about it. Um, you know the uh, the tragedy Dante's Inferno. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. Okay, so Dante Alighieri was a was an author. Um, he wrote this story about uh, a man traveling to hell to find his uh, to find his lost lover. Um, they do talk about uh, they do talk about the the different layers of hell, and we mentioned it before in uh, one of our other podcasts, but. Um, See this the uh, the Divine Comedy uh, by Dante Alighieri uh, Alighieri was written back uh, written back in the 14th century. Um, it was actually tra- we actually kind of traveled uh, the character main character kind of traveled through purgatory into hell. So kind of the culture where we talk about like the Romans and the Greeks they believe that purgatory is a uh, is a real place. And um, I believe that if we were to actually do a little bit more research into it, uh, we'd realize that. The, the different layers of hell mean different things, and each layer of hell has their own portal. So I think the different kinds of uh, demonic entities like succubus will come out of the, the layer of hell known as lust. Um, things like that. So, I mean, we talk about portals to hell like they're it's like something that's common. Um, I mean, 13 places around the world that are kind of confirmed to be some really, really haunted and could potentially be a gateway to hell is it's not as common as people think. Yeah, no, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you don't, yeah, I don't, I wouldn't want to just be walking down the street and then find myself, you know, in hell. That that would be really crappy. <laughs> I, uh, so yeah, I hope that portals to hell are not very common. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, they better not be because I mean um, I don't want to find myself in limbo one day and like magically find myself upside down by looking at some looking at some crazy looking demon. No, you know, <laughs> no doubt. 
I was interested in Clyde Barker's inspiration for this story. And, uh, you know, I think especially for like the, the Cenobites, you know, the kind of like their look, he was inspired by the Catholic church and even like the S and M culture. And I know like in, in uh, real life, there is, there's like subcultures that they, they experience pain to get not only pleasure, but to like reach kind of like, uh, heightened states of consciousness. Now you, yeah, you have people that practice what they call suspension and now, and it kind of stems from like native American and Hindu like rituals where they will actually take hooks and like hook them through their skin and they, they will like hang in the air from these hooks that are like piercing their skin and like through that pain and through like the weightlessness, they kind of like achieve this different state of consciousness. And so it's interesting, you know, to see like the different reasons. I mean, there's all different kinds of reasons why someone would do this suspension uh, type practice, you know. So it's interesting to see that happening in real life. And also, you know, you got the S&M culture. And that's, that's probably more of like a sexual thing, you know, or, you know, that they, they just get pleasure from the pain that, either they inflict on somebody else or is inflicted upon them. A lot of the aspects of Hellraiser kind of reached into S&M. Like you talked about suspension, even in the opening scene, we've seen, we've seen something that resembled suspension. Um, don't know how in any way that could be pleasurable. Um, <laughs> yeah. But just the, just a lot of the, a lot of the activities in it um, kind of reached into like the darker, the darker side of it all. So, I mean, I didn't do too much research into it, research into it just the fact that it's, it's too dark for what we are trying to accomplish. What we're trying to accomplish is talking about this uh, this puzzle box that brought these brought these uh, demons or uh, cenobites into this into our world. So, yeah. um, no, uh, S and M is kind of kind of an offshoot. So it's kind of kind of gets people thinking. But um, as far as like the enlightenment goes, uh, you're talking about experiencing pain to reach a whole new uh, level of of consciousness, um, there's a group. What they call they call themselves uh, they call themselves just enlightenment. Um, I think it was I think it was actually a book, um, and they kind of created a cult following. But they believe that experiencing pain uh, brings you enlightenment, which I mean, understandable. Uh, going uh, going back to uh, going back to Hinduism, where you have uh, you have characters like Gandhi, um, who deprived himself. Uh, of worldly pleasures to reach enlightenment. Um, I think I think that's fine, but taking it to another extreme, like these, like this group, uh, where they actually experience pain by hanging themselves from wires, putting hooks in their bodies, and even like going as far as torturing themselves. I think that's I think that's a false form of enlightenment. I guess. Right. Yeah, and it's like the uh, the uh, I think the name for it is like the ascetics, like in the <clears throat> kind of like an offshoot of the of Christianity, actually. That you could you see a good example of that in the movie The Da Vinci Code, where you have the uh, oh yeah, you have the uh, albino uh, monk, and he's like whipping himself, you know, and he's got that clamp thing on his leg. Um, but yeah, that's a good example of like of 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 the asceticism, you know, de uh, depriving yourself of worldly pleasure but that's like taking it to like a very negative level and that's yeah that's that's definitely i don't know yeah i definitely don't think that that causing causing real harm to yourself is like definitely not an area that i want to go to you know to find enlightenment i think i feel like there's probably uh, plenty of other ways to get there <laughs> yeah um something that's not in the in the horror realm here but um do you remember seeing the x2 um, the second X Men movie. Yeah. Okay, you remember how Nightcrawler would mark himself in that movie? Uh huh. That's very similar to what they kind of what uh, what Silas was trying to accomplish in uh, in the Da Vinci Code um, by uh, torturing yourself physically. Um, you're reminding yourself uh, and giving your giving yourself that uh, that feeling of uh, kind of secureness. Um, kind of beat into his head in the wrong way, I guess. But um, we've experienced uh, in the past different uh, different things. I mean, uh, with with some Catholics, we uh, they believe that uh, like nuns uh, 
they give up all they give all their possessions go live in a uh go live in an abbey to become to become a nun and they uh reject all worldly possessions and give themselves over to god completely um we see that in christianity and then we go all the way over to uh same thing with uh with islam with the women who cover themselves uh they very they dress very uh conservative where they give themselves over to their husband and their god um i think uh, when we get into the darker aspects of like religion and taking and taking it to extremes like the like the self mutilation, um, I don't want to diss anybody's religion. I don't want to diss anybody's belief, but I kind of feel like that is where we kind of draw the line, and it becomes almost it becomes almost horrific. And I think we draw we draw a lot of our we draw a lot of our inspiration from our horror movies or our writings or like or even video games from stuff like that. Oh yeah, I mean religion is a huge influence on horror movies, you know, and, and even the, the misuse of religion is too, I feel like. Definitely. Um, see, um, actually coming out, um, the third, the third movie for the, uh, for the Robert Langdon series, uh, Inferno actually kind of touches on Dante's Inferno a little bit, talking about how, uh, how this cult is, they were to release this deadly virus on the world. And the only way to solve, the only way to stop it is by solving the mystery of Dante's Inferno. And the gateways to hell. So I mean, it was, I think I thought it was kind of interesting when we uh, we started talking about this, and then I did a little bit more research into it. Um, I've never read the uh, read the Robert Langdon series. I want to. I really do. Um, I want to get into it a little bit more, but uh, I find it kind of interesting that we kind of pull we kind of pull a lot of things um, from all these old tales. I mean, we we've taken adaptate we made adaptations of them, um, and I. I really do. I really do enjoy things like that, and that's what, kind of why I like the Hellraiser series, just because it pulled a lot from, it pulled a lot of mythos out of out of the air. It put it into a, put it in a kind of a, it's almost like torture porn in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean you you have, uh, yeah you have a lot of uh, yeah people being tortured throughout the, the series. I you know I haven't actually seen like the later, a lot of the later ones, in the in the series so. Um, so I can't really say too much about that, but definitely is, uh, yeah, I guess it, <laughs> this was an early form of torture porn, as you could say. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, uh, going into like the, and this like religion thing, um, I talked about my novel before, uh, kind of the, kind of one of the present, one of the premises I got from my novel that I'm writing is the satanic cult. They believe in sacrificing people. Um, I think we get a lot of, I think we kind of, we kind of get too deep into the belief that these uh, satanic cults just sacrifice people. They also do self. They also do self deprivation. Um, I watched a documentary a while back um, talking about cults and the different types of cults. I mean, we have like we have cults in Christianity. We have cults going into like the pagan cults and the satanic cults, and even this like cults following like like silly things like Star Wars. Oh yeah, I mean you can take uh, anything to a religious level. Yeah. Definitely, and I think uh, I think we really touched on that with the uh, with Hellraiser. I think they really touched on uh, they really kind of touched on the uh, the darker side of S and M, and I think that's kind of where we draw where we kind of drew the connection. Yeah, I mean, just their I think you know with uh, the influence from the S and M subculture, it's kind of like their their uh, the Cenobites like uh, costumes that they wore, you know their their outfits, whatever, you know, very. Like the, it's all it's all like leather, you know, black leather, you know, and it's yeah. So it's very very much inspired by like that that kind of things that people would wear in that subculture. What's your pleasure, Mister Cotton? The box. Take it. It's yours. It always was. The movie series is great. I mean, I uh, I don't think I've seen the the one that came out in 2011. They had one that was kind of like a branch off uh, a branch off movie, um, following the same kind of pattern. But uh, for me, I give the I kind of give the movie like a seven out of ten if I was to rate it, just because uh, just because I'm not into like the like the major gory stuff, and it's just I like it for I like it for more of the more of the deep mythos looking into it. I mean, looking at it objectively, uh, seven out of ten. So the first Hellraiser movie, yo, 
it was uh it was released back in 1987 so it's an older movie um written and directed by clive barker i really like this movie um and like i said for anybody that doesn't know like what it's about basically it's about a guy named frank that he's like seek you know seeking the ultimate pleasure he buys this puzzle box that's promised to bring him the ultimate pleasure and he ends up summoning these beings uh from another dimension and you know and, he, and they kind of like take him back with them and uh so then after frank's disappearance his brother larry moves in the house with his wife and uh you know and during the process of moving furniture in uh larry cuts his hand and bleeds on the floor of this attic where frank had summoned the cenobites and so because he bled on the floor this blood actually soaks into the floor and brings frank back to life and then you know from the movie goes on from there but there's like some really horrific consequences to Frank coming back and uh and you know it's interesting like um you know the movie starts out you know you think it, it's mainly following uh Julia which is the wife of Larry so you know basically this story basically follows uh the characters of Julia and then Frank the guy that's brought back to life and and you kind of you know you just kind of follow them more or less through a lot of the movie but then uh, Larry's daughter Kirsty kind of becomes the main hero, you know, without giving too much away. But um, I think it's a pretty good cast. Uh, Larry is played by Andrew Robinson, and you probably will, like, I recognize him from Dirty Harry. He was the killer in that, and he's been in several other things. Um, Larry's daughter Kirsty, which is kind of like the main heroine of the movie, is played by Ashley Lawrence, and I don't think she really, like, did a whole lot of other movies, other well-known movies. This is the only thing I know her from. Um, and, and you know, and then of course, you know, Pinhead is Doug Bradley. He's probably the most well-known celebrity from this movie. Uh, you know, Pinhead is like the main demon or uh, being that they summon, basically. Uh, but this movie, you know, it's very unsettling uh, from the very beginning. You know, it, it's like just gets under your skin and like because whenever like at the very beginning when Frank is like summoning. You know, when he solves the puzzle box and, you know, you don't really see what happens after that. But you just, you see the aftermath though, all the blood and guts everywhere. And, um, you know, and, and I think one of the things that's unsettling is it's happening in this attic of a normal house that's on a normal street. And, like, from the outside of the house, you don't know that anything is really going on. But, uh, you know, this movie has a lot of atmosphere to it. I think the score really adds to the atmosphere. I think it's really good to... The set design of this movie is great. The special effects are top notch, and I, and I really feel like there's quite a lot of character depth. You know, even within the first 20 minutes or so, that you you learn a lot about Julia. You learn, you know, the Larry. You know, he's like the the husband. I, I, I think I can relate to him somewhat because whenever he cuts his hand, his reaction to the blood is is pretty funny. Because I really react that way too. I I will faint if I see blood in real life. Um, I, it's funny because. I love horror movies. I love seeing bloody scenes, but if I see blood in real life, I'm I'm gonna pass out. You know, it's kind of funny. But then there's this other scene that comes. You know, Frank's resurrection scene is just like wow. That the special effects for that scene are really great. Um, you know, the cinematography is good in this movie. Um, there's lots of cool like symbolism in this movie. Like there's some, there's a dream sequence that's really put together well. Um, you know, I think, you know, for, like, the character of Julia, she, just her character arc is really good, like, where she goes from being afraid to, you know, at, you know, there's, you know, she has to do some pretty horrible things in this movie, and, and just to see her reaction to being afraid and disgusted, or, for, you know, disgusted of her actions, to kind of seeing the change in her character to where she starts enjoying what she's doing, and, uh, you know, she's doing these things for Frank, um, and and the, the story is interesting because it's you know Hellraiser is known for Pinhead you know the Cenobites but this first movie it's not really about them I mean they're kind of like more like a sideline character in this movie you know I feel like it's more about the human capacity for evil and you know in the links that somebody's going to go to get what they want um, you know so I think Julia and Frank the they're the two main antagonists or bad guys in this movie um, the Cenobites are just very neutral characters I feel like. Um, and I, and there's a couple of like, 
things in this movie. Like, there's this character, you know, without giving too much away, I don't, I want people to go and see this movie. I'd, um, you know, I don't want to, like, give too much away, but there's, like, this character, this bum, that is really creepy. And just at the end, like, what happens with him is really cool. And I think that there's, like, there's a hospital scene where Kirsty first summons the Cinnabites. That scene is really great. The special effects, um, with the lighting and stuff, and that scene is really cool. The sounds are really great. Um, you know, and, and it's really hard for me to find any flaws in this movie. I mean, I think there are some plot holes to some degree. Um, you know, without giving too much, I don't want to like go into it too deep because it'll kind of get into spoiler territory, and I don't really want to do that. So, like for me, this movie is like a, I don't know, like I think it's like a, a nine out of ten. Um, you know, I, I feel like it's pretty close to being a perfect movie um there's just a lot a lot to like in this movie so i would say definitely go out and see it um right now it's streaming on netflix if you have a subscription go and see, check it out you definitely won't regret it i don't think i think it's it's a great horror movie you know it, you know i think and i think most horror fans know this movie they've seen it numerous times but for anybody out there that hasn't seen it maybe you're a younger person that's just kind of getting into horror uh, I'd say definitely, you know, check this movie out. It is a pretty gross movie, though. Um, I don't watch it a lot just because, you know, I kind of lose my appetite when I see it. Just because it is very gory. And even just the Cenobites are very, like... Oh, uh, they're, they're very, like, gross-looking, you know? It's just, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, once again, i just say go check this movie out. It's it's a uh, well-known horror movie for a reason. Kind of, kind of adding on to what you're saying, um... Pinhead is a very, uh, very well-known character, and that's because it's a staple of horror. Uh, his the movies that he's in are a staple of horror movies, uh, kind of like Freddy and Jason, uh, Predator, Alien, um, all those uh, all those movies and all those characters. I guess kind of have a kind of have a place in the heart of uh, horror movie fanboys. I guess you would say. But um, there's a reason behind it because they are staples of the horror genre because they're they're perfect examples of what horror is. So I mean, you can name off any character, um, uh, Chucky, and some somebody say, "Oh, that was the guy from Child's Play," or uh, the Xenomorph. That was the that was the char- that was the creature from Alien. I mean, it's kind of synonymous. I mean, you could even say you could just say Pinhead, and everyone would be like, "Oh, that's that that's that gory uh, that's that gory creepy movie with the with the chains and shit." Yeah, I mean, it, he's definitely, he's iconic, you know, he, his, you know, everybody knows who he is, and I think that, you know, what, what Clive Barker did with these, the first couple of movies was, was really good, you know, he, he built this really rich world where, with a, with a great mythology behind it, you know, there's, you know, it, it's definitely been expanded out into, like, uh, comic books, and, you know, there's a whole series of movies that, they kind of go off the rails after the first few, I think, or the first couple uh, but the first two definitely, I think, are, are uh, great movies to watch. So, hope you guys uh, enjoyed this little discussion we had on Hellraiser and and you know, portals to hell and some weird artifacts from around the world and mythology. And it's a really interesting discussion. You know, just the the concept of the concept that they bring up in Hellraiser, you know, deals with the devil and portals to hell. So, um, definitely, you know. Uh, check those things out on your own. You know, invite you to explore that more. And uh, and uh, you know, if you guys uh, want to reach out to us, you can definitely feel welcome to send us an email. Our email is blackhatpodcast at gmail dot com, um, or send us a message on one of our social media outlets on Facebook or Twitter. You can check out our website. It's at www.blackhatshadow.com. dot com. You can listen to all of our podcast episodes on there. You get links to all of our social media on there. Um, you can get links to my eBay store on there where I'm selling uh, horror movies. And my and also the YouTube channel, too. You can find the link uh, for that on there. Uh, Dakota, do you have anything you want to share with the people or let them know how to get a hold of you? Yeah, guys. Um, I put together an email. Um, you can reach out to me. Um, I can answer any questions about the movies, any questions you have about like uh, some horror mythos. <laughs> Uh, I'm kind of I'm gonna start kind of getting into that a little bit, kind of uh, being a go-to guide for those who are kind of getting into horror for the first time. 
kind of like expanding on our horror one-on-one thing. I mean, uh, we're kind of we're kind of one of those uh, kind of like an encyclopedia of useless information too. So um, you can reach out to me on Dak Shadowbane at gmail.com. Uh, it's just D A K Shadowbane, uh, all one word. Um, you can reach out to me on uh, Horamino also. Uh, it's just Rainstorm zero one R A I Y N. Uh, it's all one word. Uh, reach out to me on there. Just be looking be looking for some pictures. I'm gonna be posting some leyline uh, maps on there over the next couple of days. You can see what we were talking about with the with the pentagram over over the United States. Uh, some interesting stuff. Just reach out to us and we hopefully have some interesting conversations. Yeah. So so we're gonna go ahead and wrap up the episode. That was episode 15. And uh, stay tuned for our next episode. And so remember to take a closer look at the world around you. And you may just find it a stranger and more mysterious than you thought, especially in the Black Hat Shadow. <laughs>